Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's edition of HR Mentorship Learning Series. We have one of the industry leaders with us today. We are highly privileged and fortunate to have with us Bolaji Shote. For those of us who don't know her, I'll be reading a brief about her profile to us just in a bit. Tonight, she will be teaching us. She will be, you know, speaking to us around the tropical subject of HR data analytics for tech disruption. Because of those who may not know her, I'll be reading her profile. Please pay attention so that you will be able to know the quality of the person we are privileged to, as our, to have as our facilitator for tonight. She is a seasoned human professional with well over 13 years of experience leading teams across diverse industries. She graduated from the prestigious Obafemi Awolo University, Ileife, with a degree in philosophy and sociology. She is a member of the Chara Institute of Personal Management and also very actively involved with the Women in Business Management and Public Service, WIMBIS. She's an expert in the strategic, tactical, and traditional aspect of human resource management, and she has successfully developed and implemented policies, programs, practices through frameworks that support organizational growth, okay, and development with proven ability to drive impactful initiatives and execute projects, programs, and strategies. As part of a notable career trajectory, she has successfully implemented HR departments in three organizations and in a startup company. She has also championed and led projects working alongside HR consultancy firms like Accenture, KPMG, Ernest & Young, and others towards organizational development and transformation, okay? She, during the course of her professional career, she has also worked as a consultant, offering top-notch consultancy services that cuts across training, recruitment, employee engagement with successful completion of various HR initiatives in line with clients' needs. Okay, she's a public speaker, as you will soon see for those of us who don't know her, and uh, she has received multiple recognitions, some of which include top 100 career women in Nigeria, 2022. She was also a member of the Strategic Planning and Implementation Committee of with the Charter Institute of Personal it. Management um, in Nigeria. Backwards. Okay, so she Thank loves, you. she's passionate about people, travel, networking, writing, and she's a regular writer on LinkedIn. I'll be sharing a LinkedIn handle for anyone not following her to please follow her without further delay. Without much ado, with joy and with warm applause, let's receive tonight Bolaji Shote. You have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Yemi. Thank you for that um, warm introduction. I, in my mind, I was like, so is it me that somebody is describing so much like this? I'm just, just Bolachi, a regular person. I mean, we must never forget where we are from. I'm just one, one young lady um, with a number of years of experience. Um, and I think I want to believe that um, my outlook to life is always to remain um, as young as I can, as agile as I can, even when I'm in my 70s, I still want to identify with what is going on, what are the trends, what are the things that are happening and all of that. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us um, for this HR mentorship um, session. Um, I will be talking about HR data analytics, how you can use data analytics for tech disruption. I'd like to say as much as I'm an HR person, um, most of my experiences have been in the tech industry. So, I mean, it's in order to call me a tech enthusiast. I, I was having a discussion a few days ago, I have a teenage son and then his friend, and my son does um, graphics design. So he was talking, talking to his friend and his friend 
Um, he was like, mommy, my friend does product design. And I was like, really? I was like, what language do you use? Do you use Python or jQuery or JavaScript or C Sharp or C++? And I started mentioning all those things. And the guy was like, wow, like, is she a tech person? And I said, don't worry, I've worked with, I've worked in about four tech organizations and I've worked with developers and all of those things. So I understand um, what you're talking about. I even asked him that, is it about UI or UX? And the guy was like, wow. I said, I know about all of those things. So you're a front-end developer and all that, you know? So I want to remain agile, no matter how old I get. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so today we would be talking about analytics, and then data analytics for tech disruption, and then we'll wrap up what is data analytics? What can we call data analytics? It's all, it's, it's, um, it might sound like a buzzword. It's something that we've been hearing um, for so long. I mean, and in recent times, it's, it's now more pronounced. Um, I'd like data, being a data analyst is one of the highest paying job in the world. If you know how to use data to your advantage if you know how to use data analytic tools i remember um the last organization i worked for using power bi to just understand trends analysis and all of those kind of things and you know one of our champions back then in the organization i reached out to the guy and i said i really want to know about this and during the pandemic the guy was training me taking me through um how to understand um, and an analyze data. So data analytics is a disruptive innovation. When you're talking about disruptive innovation, let's begin to talk about the Google of, of, of the world, the um, Uber, um, so many organizations that have changed the, the dynamics of how things are done, the Airbnb, Airbnb does not even own any, any, any house, but yet I'm sure they are richer than a lot who own properties of their own. And what did they use? It was data because they realized that people want to stay in a place. Um, maybe for a short period where they don't have to necessarily go to, they, they want to stay in a place that feels like home, but it's not their own home. They don't want to stay in the hotels because there's a way hotel can feel like it's not home. So you are staying in a proper home somewhere else that makes you have that um, home-like feeling, cozy, like you're in your own comfort zone and all of those things. Uber came up with um they don't own any cars they don't own any cars all they did was um to be able to connect a driver to um a passenger without owning any cars it was data that they used as well so there are a lot of people who don't own their own cars and the people who even own their own cars but they don't want to go through the stress of driving all of these things are data driven before those businesses came into being, they must have done their visibility study and all of those kind of things before they came up with, with the data. Um, again, I used Google. Now we have chat G, GPT, if I'm right. GPT, yeah. Where you can actually begin to, um, you can have a proper presentation. By the way, I did my presentation by myself. I did not use chat GPT. And um, when we get to that, that point, I will tell you why. I mean, the originality, the creativity, the innovation for me matters to me. Um, a whole host of other things that we can begin to, to mention, how the Jumias, where delivery people do want, want to sit in the comfort of their own homes and just you know get whatever they want to get. Um, be comfortable and um, be able to do what they need to do. And so data analytics is basically 
a disruptive innovation. Let's not forget that. Um, one second, please. So when we're talking about data analytics, it is a process of examining one raw data. You collect data, raw data. People, for those of us who did economics in secondary school, where you pull data together, it could be historical data, raw data. Excuse me, excuse me. Like you going to count people, you going to take um, um, stock, you going to do something. You, you, I mean, it is a process of examining raw data, finding patterns. That's where, I mean, I didn't really like that part of economics at the time because I was not good at drawing. So you had to draw, plot a map that shows, or even in mathematics. Let's not even go into mathematics. I just struggled through school to just um, finish my mathematics. And fortunately or unfortunately, after running away from math in the university, I still had to do well, not sort of mass, it was logic, it was even worse than mass, if you ask me. And then um, when I was doing my CIPM, trying to qualify for my CIPM exams at the time, we had to do operations research. And operations research, if you look at it, is basically about data, using data to make decisions, using data to um, being able to make logical decisions, not based on emotions not subjective, objectively able to analyze data and infer to say something is um, might happen based on the pattern. After collecting the data together, you then look at the, the pattern and then you infer from it to say, if A is equals to B, then if C is equals to D, minus B or something, just be able to look at this data that you're seeing and then likely to say, oh, if A happened and B happened, it's likely that C will happen. So you make predictions um, from using those, those data. I'm not talking of religious predictions where somebody will say, oh, you know what, this person is going to be the the next president of Nigeria and all of that. That's not what we're talking about here. This one, you are seeing the data that you are going to use. You've already looked at the data. You've even looked at the, the pattern of the data to say, okay, maybe at some point, I, I'll give an instance. A good data might be that a lot of people spend, it is being proven if on the internet, Research shows that people buy, tend to spend a lot more during the end of the year. And that's why we have that January where everybody is, every, things are tight pretty much. You really, really have to be, um, I'm, I'm very sure very few people because of the festive period, a lot more people tend to spend um, money, tend to be, in an happier mood where they will spend money and do um, enjoy themselves. Ah, you know, this thing they say, I can't come and kill myself. You know, people would have um, walked all through the year as well and just say, you know what, this is a time to party. And in the middle of that, a, a lot of people, their excesses, some of the data as well that uh, has been used is that there are more accidents. It's not. I'm sorry to say, again, it's not religion to say, oh, um, um, Ember months in this part of, of the world, we tend to um, believe, have some beliefs um, in the supernatural. It's not like I'm not saying I don't believe in the supernatural, but these are just things that <laughs> a driver is drunk. And I'll give you a typical example. I, I was going on a trip with um, some people. And then the driver that was taking us started using his phone. He was calling. I wasn't, I wasn't in, in Nigeria at the time. I was, I was in Dubai. And then, you know, I went for a holiday and then the, the person was calling 
as he was driving. This is a country where they are very strict with things like that. You report the person, the person is in trouble. You know, and I want to tell you why data is in, important. Is is because as seen happen, I'm used to to data. So I'm like, if he does A, is likely to result in B. I tried to call this young man to order. He wasn't so young. I said, why are you picking your calls when you're, he was he was speaking in another language that I couldn't understand. He was literally abusing me and all of that. Do you know what I did? All I did was just send the company because he was taking us for a de desert safari. Send communication with me to say I, I booked the um holiday with them. I don't have any business with this guy. Try to, I mean, speak to his voice of reasoning, and he, he didn't answer me. I just sent a message to, to them and I said, you know what? Um, the boss that is taking us is endangering our lives throughout. And I kid you not, this guy was on the phone. And I started panicking. Why was I panicking? He, he had nothing to do with the spiritual. It's just logic. You can't be using one hand to drive and then you're using one hand to receive phone calls. It's literally... Um, what was what, what he's literally disconnected from reality because his mind is on whatever phone call he was and he, he was driving on the highway why am i making this kind of scenario for you and i had to report the situation and i mean he was he was addressed luckily but i'm sharing the story because that day my decision was not based on anything spiritual it was just logical to say if you are distracted on the phone and you're not, you, 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 he wasn't even looking at where he was going. He wasn't looking at where he was driving. He was literally on the phone and talking all the time. There is a high likelihood that the car may have an accident. And trust me, that's how accidents happen. It's been proven. Or maybe somebody is drunk. That's why they say, don't drink and drive. Because this has shown that when you are drunk, you don't know what you're doing. You literally, most people will get drunk. They're not in sync with reality because the alcohol has tampered with their body system. You are seeing yourself really flying or jumping or seeing yourself swimming, almost like a dream. But in real reality, a dream is not a dream. I had a, a, a story of a, of a friend who got drunk and just, you know, got to her house and slept on the door to her house at the time. That's what alcohol does. And that's why they say, don't drink and drive. Don't drink and drive. Again, another data I can mention. Why do you think they say smokers are liable to die young? Because they know that over a long period of time, nicotine would damage um, the lungs or cause something, the, the tobacco, all the chemicals in, in the smoking. So let's look at all of this. So when people come up with predictions and say smokers are liable to die young, um, don't drink while you drive, um, don't receive phone calls while you drive. That's why even from this, the, the laws are made, rules are made from data to say, oh, let us come up with this rule to help us. Why do you think those rules are put in place? It's to help to either address an issue, um, promote a particular narrative, maybe a positive narrative in the society to change, to also change narrative or change perspective is because they collect data okay so there's another data that i'm going to mention they say in in nigeria we have um um what's it called 10 point something million children are out of school how did they arrive at that is through all of this data analytics that we've been talking about they look for raw data probably go to schools and maybe from door to door, or look at the number of children that were born as against, okay, how many of them are in school, 
bring the school data, how many schools do they have, how many students in each school, then compare the data with how many children are born. And, you know, from there, you are able to compare it to see that ah, there is a large number of children. So maybe the children, um, they say at least you should be able to read maybe primary school or GSS 3. Is GSS three for Nigeria? I mean, if if you, you study to GSS three, you are fine. So a lot of those ten million people that we're even talking about, that means they've never gone to school at all. They've never seen the four walls of school. And how do they get it? Data. Let me quickly move on. Um, data analytics um, is a decision making tool. You use it to make decisions. Um, and these decisions. It provides an organization with advantage over other companies. It provides a company rather advantage over other companies. How is this done? When you have data to your advantage, you know where your customers are, you know a lot of things. I used to work with a tech company that was into data analytics and I got exposed to a lot um understanding how data works you do customer address verification um they were using um the company was using at the time gis which is geographic information systems technology to map places points of interest i got involved in it so i understand how data works you Companies use it to do customer address verification. Where Thanks. if some well. companies use it for customer address verification, where you need to know where your customers are, where are the location of the customers, what do they do, what are their professions, um, do they really stay where they told you, where they wrote for you that they are they are staying? It was basically to um banks were using it at the time for kyc uh you go to the bank you feel kyc and then you find out maybe when the person gets a loan probably the house the person has told you in fact so people who put bush thick bush forest as the way to their house so it was now that customer address verification that was used to start knowing that this particular address is not is not valid so with that, the bank will not open the account for the, 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 the customer until they have an address that can be verified where they will say the person lives in this place. It take coordinates of that place. Very interesting um, exposure at the time. And that's one of the things um, data helps to um, achieve. It gives people advantage because in people collecting loans and there's no proper KYC. You don't even know where these people are. What, are what, what is their profession? If somebody comes to you, in my, when I first started my HR career, I, I, I used to train for, for the banking industry and I really got exposed to macroeconomic analysis. One of the challenges then at the time is know your customers. Data gives you opportunity to know your customer. And when I say know your customer, I'm not talking of KYC at this time. Data about your customer, what are their preferences? Where do they stay? What, what market are you trying to play in? Are you on the lower end? Are you on the higher end? This, that, there was one of the data that got interesting that at a time, every bank wanted to open a branch on Aula Road in Ikoi. Why are banks opening branches in Awolowo Road in Nikoi. Is it that there are businesses there that, I mean, or is it for prestige? What exactly is the reason why people are, you know, opening um, branches, banks? Every bank, once a bank opens in a popular road like this, everybody wants to open there. When we get to that point where um, we'll talk about how you should go about data finding, um, we would be able to um, go into it. Um, so typically, it gives you a competitive advantage over other companies. Sorry, one second, please. I'm trying to minimize 
this. I can see myself. I can see hear me. So it's I can't really see part of my slides. Okay, great. I can see it now. Thank you. So it enables organization identify new opportunities. Remember, like I said, why is, is a bank opening? Why would a bank open in a lower road? Is it that there are business opportunities there? So you need to have that data to be able to say, okay, so maybe if I open in our lower road, we find out that most companies want to are also on our lower road. So it makes it accessible to the maybe the ultra high net worth individuals or the high net worth individuals to be able to reach them. The big boys and the big girls live in Ikoi, Victoria Island axis. So maybe being on our lower road would you know, attract those kind of customers to yourself. It also leverage insight to make strategic decision making. Um, a lot of developed countries actually use leverage on insight to make strategic decision. So you will see data um, that says, you know, post COVID, most people do not want to commute to work. So most companies are now thinking of it. Okay, if the person's job does not require them, they use that data to their advantage. Why can't we ha be having fully remote jobs? If people can do these jobs um, by being fully remote, why can't we do it? You know, that's what data helps you to. And guess what? Those com com um, companies, that go through that way, they will attract more candidates. They will be able to get the right people um, to work for them. So there's this um, visa that has been going on in the European Union. It's called Digital Nomad. It's a kind of visa that people can actually, you know, move from one place, move to a country, get a visa as a digital nomad, it's not like they want to stay there forever, but you know what? Maybe I have my my job is in is in Kano in Lagos. I want to explore Lagos. I like Lagos life and no party like Lagos party, but my job is in Kano. So those countries, a lot of countries in the EU are opening their borders. It is data that's giving them that opportunity to do that. Governments worldwide have used statistics based on censuses for a variety of planning, including taxation, building of roads, hospitals. In, 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 um, for real estate people who are marketing, in those days, in fact, I had a conversation with um, someone a few days ago, and the person was saying, the Lekki Aja axis used to be total. You, you can't even go past this place. They were thick bush. I remember my dad of blessed memory also said that years ago in the 80s, some people told him to come and buy land in this area. And he was like, for what? Where maybe the last place you will see will probably be where mobile is in VI today. Look at what data has done. So people who had that foresight have been able to look at the data to say, okay, what would the growth expansion be? If Nigeria is going to grow X, Y, Z, then that means more people might want to move to this, um, to move to Lagos, you know? So we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to do that. And informs a lot of, not even just government, business activities too. People will come and say, I want to invest in Nigeria based on ABC, XYZ. Or I am not investing in Nigeria because it's an unstable economy. I remember in the in the time when Nigeria used to be from one military coup to the other, people could not predict what was going to happen, how long things were going to last. But look at it in the last since um is it the third republic now, since 1999, these 22 years, relatively every four years, a new government changes, it's still data. So people can say, okay, they're not like how they used to be where 
in two months, <laughs> there might be a coup. In, in another six months, maybe another coup. That's what they helps to achieve. And Ford me measured the speed of assembly lines using data. In 20, 2017, where we're really going is using data analytics for people management. In 2017, Deloitte reported that 71%, I repeat, 71% of companies said that they considered people analytics a high priority for the organization, with 31% rating it as very important. And what, are, what areas of um, people analytics are we talking about? You want to talk about recruitment and selection, how you get people in, into the organization, um, how you shortlist, what are the metrics for assessing people? I mean, data will tell you what should be the age. Some of the data people collect age. Some collect data on class of degree, which I mean, maybe after a while, I also read um, an analysis that, that is saying that maybe class of degree does not really matter. It's more of skills in, in the new order that we're getting, the future of the workplace, which we're already living in. People are beginning to talk about what skills people need to function in the place and not necessarily their class of degrees. We've seen people who have studied biology, zoology, and they are doing very well in HR. And we've seen doctors become human resources consultant. I have a medical doctor that is my friend and is a human resources consultant. So the, the people are beginning to think that maybe it's not necessarily what people go into to study in the university. So imagine you are trying to recruit and then you're saying, oh, maybe for some skills, I don't want to generalize it. I mean, for a medical doctor, you will still need to be a medical doctor. You can have additional skills. You need to go to medical school to be able to treat your patient. I would not want somebody that I know that is not a medical doctor to come and treat me. The person will say, I studied HR, but I can, I can, do it. I can be a doctor. Maybe not. Or you have um, somebody that says, I'm a teacher, but I can build this road for you. Maybe not. I can build a house. Even with the people that are professionals, people are still having issues with some, some experiences that we've had. We had an issue of uh, where people were using substandard products and houses started collapsing. People were losing their lives and things like that. It's all about data. Do you know that there is what they call weather data? Weather is used to collect data. In, Cold regions. When it's winter, people have what winter blues. They begin to feel very sad and all of those kind of things. It's all about data. Why? Because of the weather. So back to um, what we were talking about, using it for recruitment and selection um, to identify talent, who are the right talent, attracting the talent, creating your brand um, profile, having a strong employee value proposition, and so many other things. You have um, employment performance management, how is performance a judge? What are the metrics to use in a judging performance and all of those kind of, 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 of things. You have um, understanding attrition and retention. What are the things that makes people stay on a job? How long are people are staying on a job? Do you know that a um, data collection has shown that most people now have an average of two years on a job before they move, move on. If you get that kind of data, you begin to ask yourself, why are they leaving their jobs every two years? Then you need to be able to use that data to your advantage. Maybe they are bored, maybe they remain, and one of the, when you look at from the data, why people are leaving after two years, they will tell you no opportunity for career growth, maybe they're not growing in their career, more money, they want um, higher pay of 30%, so they become job uppers, automatic, uh, automatic rather, job uppers. I had a young tech lady. We used to work in the same organization. Two weeks ago, she came to my inbox and she said, Mama, I need your help. I said, what help? She said, I need another job. I said, what's wrong with 
Is it your job that you have? I know the company she works for is one of the best in the country and all of that. She said, I don't want to stay too long on the job. That's almost all my friends are, have moved on after one year on their jobs. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, the job is fantastic. The job is great, but I don't want to stay there. Again, data. People, we have different generation in the workplace. We have the Gen Z, we have the millennials. Their mindset is different from the mindset of the baby boomers or the generation X like myself and some other people, the Gen Z, a whole lot of things are changing. Then let's talk about things like attrition. Why are people leaving? Where are they leaving to? There's a lot of attrition rates going on in Nigeria, jackpot syndrome. But there's what you call jackpot to jackpot, like somebody says. Jackpot to jackpot means people who jackpot from a job to another job. There are different kinds of jackpot to jackpot. People are jackpotting from country to country. So it, it's a whole lot and it's data. People just want to get jobs and say, you know what? I, I, I'm not steady. I'm not stagnant. I have growth. It gives them something to say, I'm doing, I'm doing something new. And all of this data, from the occurrences, a smart people manager will use it to their own advantage, measuring learning and development outcomes, the return on investment for training. What are you training people for? I used to recall that um, at the point in time, companies were being asked, what is, should we just train for the fun of it? Um, in the past, Companies used to train. People used to want to learn for the fun of it. Now people are, it's changing. People want to learn for specific. Are they trying to acquire a new skill? Are they deepening their strength to become a thought leader to know more in that area? You can see all of these aspects of HR that I'm talking about. I've had opportunity to be a recruitment an employee engagement specialist in the course of my HR career, managing just recruitment and employee engagement. That was what I was doing at the time. So having all of this kind of data will help a people manager to know, okay, so what are the things I need to do? What are the um, ways I need to work with the management, partner with the manager? I have this data. What am I doing with them? And data is around us every day unless we open our eyes to see. I'm particularly very, I'm a data enthusiast. Once I get into an organization, um, to when I resume for the job, the first thing I'm looking for is data. I'm looking at the data of how people have joined, how people have stayed in the organization. It gives me an idea of the kind of people I'm been dealing with in the first instance. How long has this one been here? How long has this one, that one been here? What are the things they have in place? What are the things they don't have? What is the trend? A whole lot of things like that. And I would advise that you do the same thing. Learning and development. People want to, to learn in, people want to learn in an environment that is exciting, that is interesting for them. They want learning that will benefit them, not just, I think this is where send people to, to training and they'll say, what, what, is, what am I doing in this training? What's my business in this training? He has no alignment with what I want to achieve or even my job. No, no correlation. But when you have data, it helps you to send people for the right training that they can use and you will see the impact in the workforce. Um, compensation and benefit decisions. So now people are, um, asking for much more than what they had before. People are leaving jobs that are of higher pay, going to jobs of lower pay that will give them, excuse me, work-life balance or life-work balance, anyone you want to call it, where I can infuse my life into my job. I don't have to actually take on a different persona. Ah, because I'm a who wants a thing with. Let me go to work, do my work, be productive, I don't want to work in a place where everybody is just is, is just streamlined, 
you, you, you nothing nothing great is happening people will not want to stay in that work environment um those are um salary they would rather negotiate to have a lower salary and you giving them an opportunity to have hybrid or work fully remotely that's where we got into that's what data has helped in achieving and people are looking for shares or stock option if i leave people are leaving bigger named so to organizations nobody knows the organization startup that are just coming up based on what the startup will have told them if you come to this startup and we do well you put in the best and the company is going to do well for each um whatever that we landmark you will get about 1000 shares of the company you know seems more attractive than a company where giving me any shares they're just paying me money the mindset shares stock options um we have health and awareness people are talking where they want to go to they want to have the organization is committed to their health it's not just about work 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 they are not machines they're not robots people want to work in that place health and wellness um okay so okay, let's talk about actually i missed this part of a brief history of data analytics i'm just going to um go through um, this slide because i think it's very interesting data has been with us for so long it's not something that is new he says that his statistics, which were supposed to have been used as far back as ancient Egypt. Egypt is one of the oldest um, economies in the world. And it is said that is the um, statistics or data analytics that was used for building the Egyptian pyramids. The use of data analytics date, dated back to the 19th century where Frederick Winslow Taylor initiated time management exercises for people to manage their time. Where you talk about priority, what, do you, how do you prioritize your work? We all know this um, important, not urgent, not important. What do you do if you, you if, if there's a tax and it's not urgent, it's not important. Maybe you eliminate it. If it's urgent but not if it's urgent but not important, then you 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 can push it forward. If it is important and urgent, you know that you have to attend to, to that. It's all about data. Maybe it has a deadline and you need to close that deadline. You don't have a choice. You have to do it at that point in time. And you need to give it high priority so that you can achieve what you need to achieve. The new technologies have played a huge role in the rise, in the rise in the use of um, data analytics. Technology has also supported data analytics as technology grew. We remember the days of typewriter. If we're still using typewriter and I will not be talking about data. How long will it take you to be putting all the data, data that you need together? Analytics began receiving more attention as computers became decision make, making support systems. As people needed to make decisions, they were looking for things that will support their decision so that they can reduce error rates. Well, so you see things that tells you that you, human error will be eliminated to something minimal. In 1880, it took the US seven years to get census to count people, seven years. Yet 10 years later, it took them 18 months with the use of tabulating machine invented by Eman Olerit. Isn't that an interesting fact? The same within a period of 10 years, the development um, of data analytics helped to reduce drastically. Look at the ratio of 18 months to seven years. I'm not very good with maths, but I can have an exact. Um, 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 12 months will be around 144, 144, 144 months compared with 18 months. You can see how data analytics has helped to fasten and quicken the, the process. 
and I'm sure in today, in today's world, um, why in 2023, over 1990, uh, 1990 to now, over a century later, or over 130 years later, over 130 years later, I'm sure that they can get um, census done in one month or even days. Maybe not in Nigeria, but for the US. Because they have all the tools, they have all the technologies that can get it done for them faster and quicker. Okay, so to managing data for tech disruption. Tech disruption will always take place. Who would have thought that COVID was going to happen in 2020? Nobody could make that prediction. Those are predictions that it took everybody unawares. Nobody was prepared for it because nobody saw it coming. But yet, people still had to move on. Businesses had to survive. And those that did not, did not survive it, they died. The business died. Those that did not upskill themselves, align themselves with the trend or how things were going, they found out that they couldn't keep up with the pace anymore. There will always be disruption. When I was doing NYC, I used to remember those days. I served in a village in Benue State. You will kill. You even the day you want to go and collect your um alawi. I was living in another village. I have to go to another village. And if you see, you have to go there in time if you don't want to miss. And then when it's four o'clock, they will tell you that no space again. 20 years later, I can't remember the last time I entered the banking hall to go and kill for money until the recent Naira scarcity. But even at that, I still didn't get money. I was only able to get 3,000 naira from one bank. And afterwards, I just started using, I, even before I am relating with you, I want to, do you want, because I don't have cash, you know? So recognize that change is constant. Now I heard that the Supreme Court, I said the monies could be spent. And I said this to one of my friends, I said, it would be very difficult for people to go back to, to the status quo anymore. Because I have literally survived. I pay taxi man. <laughs> Either you use POS or transfer. I pay bread money. I pay lights. I, I do everything using uh, whatever. And I'm sure that with that Naira scarcity that happened, there were a lot of people that jumped on the train that were not there before. It would be very difficult for them to change again to start spending money. I kid you not. That's what change does. Recognize that change is constant. Data evolves. So more, there are more people that have jumped on that technology of saying, we don't necessarily have to have cash to spend or do transaction. In the rural areas, yeah, maybe a few, but even some of them, when it got really bad, they had to be like, realign themselves. So they know it's already possible. That's where we go to. Don't change for the sake of change. Don't change for the ch sake of change. I had a friend um, who for many years never used ATM card. He used to say, I just want to go to the and collect my money. I am not interested in ATM. I don't understand how those things work. I don't understand how internet banking work, works. So you need to understand why you are doing what you want to do. It's not that yeah, they say everybody's doing remote work. You just jump into it and then you say, oh, I want to do remote work. Everybody's doing this, you just jump into it. You need to understand, look at the trends. Then look at the dynamics. You may need to look at the dynamics of the industry you are operating. You may need to look at the dynamics of even the job roles in your organization. You may look at, at the dynamics of your operating environment. 
some people will say some companies do not want Nigeria to, a, a lot of um, um, employers are not comfortable with um, Nigerians working from home at the time. Why? So you don't want a situation where somebody wants to have a meeting with a client and the person will say, I don't have um, lights to power my gen. The NEPA factor, the um, factor. In some countries, those are not their reality. There's nothing like internet is going bad or there's no light. They have like two, four, seven or traffic has caught them on the road. They're living in Lagos. They've been on the road for five hours. Some people, it is not their reality. So you just jumping on it might not really be the best for you if you don't understand the peculiarities and the dynamics of either your industry, your creating environment, microeconomic analysis, government policy, and a whole lot of other things like that. You need to understand it. Those that are obtainable as it contains human resources in, in United Arab Emirates, um, in, in Luxembourg, in the UK, in the US. In fact, in the US, those laws are even peculiar state to state. So what happens in Texas might not be applicable in another state, in Boston, Massachusetts, you know? You need to understand it. When you want to um, use data to your advantage, focus on the problem, not the technology. If you focus on the technology, you will miss it. There are people who, are, who have purchased technology that they couldn't use for what they needed to use it for. Embrace on technology. Don't be afraid of technology. You can let nobody came with any skill. Let me say this. We are most product of nurturing as against nature. Nobody learned most of the things we are doing today. Yes, there are people that it comes to them naturally. I like writing. I like speaking, I like doing this and all of that. But there were skills I had to learn when I got to HR. Collecting data. I did not bring it from heaven. Nobody brought anything from heaven. Even the people that know maths and know logic and know how to, they taught them. So you can choose to learn what you need to your advantage. Watch out for old wines in new bottles. Things that are not working for you, you need to critically assess using data to say, what am I using this thing for? And I'll give you a typical example. Again, when I was working in my last organization, um, during the pandemic, we did, which was championed by me leading HR to move the company to continuity plan. And when we did the business continuity plan, we were on lockdown. It became a problem to get before. If anybody wants to sign a letter, he wants to physically sign it. Every single thing changed. We eliminated physical paper. There was nothing like physical paper anymore. No physical paper in that organization anymore because we were doing digital transformation at the time and the company wanted to become a digital native organization. So you can never see anybody that will carry paper around. Where is the paper? Who will you give the paper to? Everything you want to do, go and do it online. And it wasn't as if after COVID, we changed back and say, oh, COVID has gone now. Oh, yeah, bring the paper. No, no more paper. Paper is off from that organization forever. It has been eliminated. So you can't be doing something you say you don't want to do aligning yourself, then you're not sure what, whatever you want. You, you eliminate a culture that is not working for you. From your data, you see that this thing is not working. I will tell you another one. I work for a company where they are, um, I observed that it was data that I used in, in changing what I needed to change at the time. I observed that um, they had a, a practice. The practice was when people have welfare, maybe they give birth, they go, they have a wedding and everything. They didn't have any policy about it. So what used to happen is people will start contributing. I'll be going, ah, yeah, me, please, can I, can you contribute? But I just had a baby. 
Ah, uh, Bolaji just got married. Oh yeah, Yemi come and contribute. Tolu come and contribute. BC come and contribute. And then when everybody finished contributing, ma management will now say, how much have you people contributed? They will now add to it. But there was a problem with that policy. He eliminated people that were that were not um, friendly, one, that were not extroverts. So you need to be known for you to be able to get anybody that will give you anything. Some people, they will say, who is that? When did you join this organization? Well, I don't know. I don't talk to her. She's not in my unit. So she's not. I just collected all the data. I've seen cases as the thing were happening because I couldn't make the changes. You know, practices are very difficult to change, especially when you meet them there. So you need strong data. And that's what I always do. I will get all the data and I will use it to make a case. So I started bringing all the data as we were collecting money on, and I made a case. In, in scenario A, we found out that of the five people that we did in the last three months, only two people were able to get this XYZ amount. One, and data showed that they were, maybe their friends, people felt open to them. And the question then is, should the people who were ex over, or I just came into the organization, maybe I just joined the organization and I'm just getting married. Nobody will know me now because I'm still pretty much new in the organization. But should that stop me from, you know? And that was what led to the creation of a strong welfare policy. The one of people contributing was totally eliminated and the company had standard to say, if you are doing wedding, we'll give you if we were doing this, we we're doing that. I couldn't have achieved that thing if I didn't have data. <laughs> My boss is so unemotional, like a typical um, business owner or business leader. You have to justify why. And it's your data that will help you justify. And the data were there. So I just used it and that's how I, I got it done. And for, a for many other initiatives like that, drive HR strategy and operations with data. You can't even get anything done in HR that will be meaningful without data. So quickly going to go into tips to managing data for tech disruption. What are the things that you need to do? Embrace the new logic and don't write up challenges. Ask, how can you redesign your capability to deliver better value than upstart or incumbent competitors? What are people doing? What are the things that, and don't wait. Quickly use data to your advantage that you don't have to wait for that thing to come and hit you before I realign myself. Let me realign myself. And I'll take a typical example. When COVID-19 came, a lot of, a lot of um, countries started shutting down. Some did not shut down in, in time. They didn't, they were still waiting to see, is it true? Is it really true? Is it not true? Then the thing entered. And then when people also started saying, go on lockdown. So people say, no, I'm not going on lockdown. I have to drink, I have to marry, I have to enjoy myself. I have to party with my friends. What do you mean? We have never seen this kind of thing in our life. And people were dying. So don't wait till something comes to eat you before you use the data, whether the ones that you've collected or the one that has been presented out there to begin to realign yourself. Start now, but move deliberately. Again, the COVID-19 theory of work from home. I remember then, again, when we're talking of work from home, we didn't even create a, a, the organization that was at the time to create a work from home. And I must give it to my boss at the time. He said, Let's think beyond COVID. Let's think beyond COVID because COVID will come and go. I brought out a work from home policy. He said, no, let's sit down and strategize how we're going to move this policy. It is, it's beyond COVID with the way I see it. Because I mean, we had a strategy session and they were asking people, how has it been for you? People will be like, ah, I now work better. My productivity has gone higher. This, I'm now that. And he said, Okay, so if people are more productive, then do we really need to come to the office? Guess what? Our work does not, we're a tech company. Our work does not involve us to physically see customers. 
I said the customer say, oh, by fire, by force, come to my, then you can go. So maybe we need to do something in that regard. And that was what we did and came up with the value focused work. It's mission agnostic. It only measures your performance on the job. And that thing changed the charity of the organization and increased productivity by almost 90% at the time because it was measured. We saw that people could do more. You know, the business was growing. We we're able to expand into territories. In during COVID, we expanded into about five or six countries just using that strategy because it made it faster. Before, when I used to recruit, I would have to go physically go to the country to say, oh, we want to open in Ghana, go to Ghana, HR, go and conduct whatever. But with the value focused work from Nigeria, we're recruiting people from Botswana, from the UAE, from the UK, from Canada, from everywhere. So you need to be more deliberate, even when you have the data. Craft your customer's future. The most effectively, and for HR, for most HR people, the first customers, people you manage, and you have other stakeholders, um, even the, the employees, family member, they are your customer. Because we've seen cases where husband will say, my wife, that job cannot take your life because the work-life balance is not okay. I don't see my wife. You're always working two for seven. Oh, yeah, leave the job. Don't worry, I'll open shop for you. And you see how, how that has affected the family life? The most effective consumer companies rely on privileged access to their customers. They know what their customers want or where their customers are going through or where the, the likely impact of the action of their customers. And immediately they, 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 they jump on it and say, you know what, this is the trajectory of where these people will be. So imagine what has happened in Nigeria now. Some companies will have sat down and looked at the um, turn of events in in the last one one and a half months when there is near scarcity and own a lot of gaps. And some people will use those gaps, use the data, how many are not able to access their bank account. You saw people fighting, people trying to jump and things like that. It means that there is there is a need somewhere that needs to be addressed. Challenge the rules and don't maintain status quo. Status quo is, ah, we've been doing it like this. Let us remain that way. Ah, no, this was how we met it here. Please leave it, don't touch it though. If you touch it, it's a problem. You have to challenge rules. Always ask yourself, why are we even doing this thing? If you ask and you cannot justify it objectively, to say, why are we even doing this thing? Why? Do we need to be fiscally appear to do this or something? You need to ask yourself all of those kind of questions and challenge the status quo. Yes, we might have been doing it like this, but we'll do it differently. I seen a CEO who was recruited into a company and the company was not making profit. And he said, you know what? I need to know why the company is good. I want to change the status quo. The company is going to make profit. And barely a year after, the company recorded profits. How are we challenging the status quo? Okay, they said this is how it is. But if it's not, if we're not gaining anything from it, then I mean, we can let it go. Define a new way of work um, where, you know, how do you work? What do you do? How do you do what you, you do? Yes, so really, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. HR responded and managed the COVID-19 pandemic very well. If you're an HR person, you must give yourself kudos. If you were managing people during COVID-19 for something HR had never seen before, HR quickly realigned and was able to successfully manage um, the workforce during the, the pandemic. But later, Started presenting challenges because I mean, 
there is now a change, a new order of things. You were hearing things like um, lockdown, this, uh, work from home, what else, quarantine, a whole lot of things. You were hearing vaccine. I knew of a company that they said, if you are not vaccinated, you cannot come to work because somebody had COVID and then everybody spread COVID to everybody in the office. Those were things HR had to deal with during the pandemic. And as an HR person, and I'm sure for some of us that on this um, webinar, um, you, should, you should give yourself a pat on the back if nobody did. For something nobody even understood, they were struggling to know what exactly the thing was mutating from Delta to D to that to that. I mean, it, it was such a huge mess. But in spite of it all, human resources professionals were able to manage the pandemic and able to not only take most organizations that did not align themselves died. They don't exist again. But it also presented challenges. People needed to prove themselves. So you had issues like burnout, HR job posting of over 130% compared to pre-COVID numbers and fewer resources than ever. People died. People had to be in the front line. You needed more doctors. You needed people were having mental health issues. Somebody, so there were a whole lot. I had a one that an employee had sat down on, on a chair in his workplace, and people thought he was doing selfie or something. And they were all taking pictures with him, but the guy was dead. So, I mean, it created a whole lot of new kind of issues and all that. Despite it meeting expectation and creating value for both HR and the business, survey data uncovered key areas HR leaders could improve upon. If you are an HR person and you can use data insights and data analytics, it will give you just, you, 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 you will not struggle on your job. Be the best you can be because everything that is happening in the organization, you are connecting it, you are collecting the data, you are using it to make decision, you are spreading it to the leaders, you are enforcing new rules, enforcing how things should be done. HR is not just about um, um, oh, the soft side. There's also the tough side of HR where you have to put those things in place. Because if you don't put them, maybe at the time when companies were saying, okay, if you're not vaccinated, please stay at home. When people say coming to work, because guess what? We don't want people to come and have COVID and die. Don't come and spread COVID. I remember we had a retreat then as well. Oh, should we have the retreat? Should we not have the retreat? There's COVID, blah, 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 blah. We wanted to have the retreat. It's a, it's a yearly cultural practice. And one of the things that we did to help people at the time, we did a data, we, we, we did a survey. Everything we do in the organization, I always insisted data will help us and it used to help us. So we asked, people wanted to come, but they were afraid of getting COVID. Oh, that I cannot shake hands. I don't want to hug some of that. So what did we do? We had these tags, we created these tags. For those who eventually wanted to come, if you don't want to come, we made we made the event before COVID. The event was fully physical. COVID, post COVID, it became digital and virtual. Sorry, physical and and virtual. If you wanted to attend all over the world, you can be there. If you want to come, come. And then if you are coming, we also created tags. There were um, three tags. There is I can do with maybe a leg or arm shake. There are some people, they, nobody should come near me. So you see it's red. I don't want anybody to come near me. Don't even move near me. And then there are some people, <laughs> I'm all, I'm good to go. You can hug me, you can do high five, you can do anything. It's a choice. You need to find creative ways to balance things based on data.
So when people see people across the organization, once I see you, you're on green, and I'm on green, we say, ah, you're my friend. If I see you wearing yellow, amber, hmm, that means you can say, what's up? Or if I see you wearing red, I will give you uh, social distancing. I will give you social distancing. I will not even move close to you because this one is telling me, <laughs> I can burn you because don't, don't come near me, you know, danger. So, I mean, data insights and data analytics, and then you have cloud transformation, HR systemization. Notes, disruption does not have to mean despair. When there are disruption, people begin to panic. Meanwhile, there are companies, institutions, there are human beings, who always benefit from disruption. So it's a choice for you to say, yes, there is a disruption. How can I leverage the disruption to my own advantage, to my company's advantage, to my professional advantage? Innovation gives undue um, advantage. So this part says, um, I can't even see what the part says actually, the, the, the top. But I think um, manage using you know, you know, tips to you know, I finish this and I'm gone from this. One second, please. Embrace innovation. Embrace innovation. Creativity is different from innovation. Creativity, you you create something. Innovation is finding new ways. And for those that would really excel and reach the, the pyramid of their career, you have to be a very innovative person. A lot of innovations that were started, I mean, creative things that people started, you have to bring it on board again and begin to analyze it. Is it relevant again? Do we need it? Uh, ask the people that you are giving, do they even like it? Maybe they don't want, maybe they don't need it. I remember one time where I was working in the financial institution, a company in, in the financial institution sector. We had a policy that we, we, we didn't used to give um, health insurance. We used, to, we used to give people some lump sum for their health insurance. And then they can do anything they wanted to do with it. But we found out that most people were not doing anything with it. They weren't using the money for anything. So people would say, oh, my husband's office, my office, yeah. Trust me, they were not using anything. And then we had a major incident. A staff got sick. This staff eventually died. That was the game changer. Because if that guy had had HMO, I'm not sure, to be very honest, in all sincerity, he wasn't, whether he might be in HMO or not, was what killed him. But he brought out something for us to say, let's challenge this status quo. There's money for health, we're just judging people to go and be spending, and they are not even taking care of their health. So we came back. Again, I was, I was in the forefront of that to manage it. And then, you know, to be able to say, how do we go about it? So um, we, we, came, we came together and then from coming together, we agreed that what we'll be doing going forward is that that money, even if you want to collect, we're not saying you must collect it too. For those that they already have, it, it doesn't make sense for people to have dual insurance. So if you have your insurance, you need to show us the proof so that we know that your is covered. And for those that did not have, we now went to have relationship with HMOs to say, HMO, ABC, you have variety you can choose from. But you will, that money that we're dashing you, you will take HMO from it. And then if you want to blow the rest, feel free to have fun. That's what data helps you to do. Innovation gives on is also innovative and being able to think through how can we refine this process, how do we sustain it, sustainability. Innovation also is a part of sustainability. You just 
you've come up with something before it's running. Don't just leave it to be running, 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 running. Maybe they don't even like it. From time to time, ask them, this thing that we're giving you, how do you feel about it? Is it serving its purpose? You will be shocked sometimes. Some people don't want it. One time that we're giving long service award. Some people say they don't want that. They want the they want um to own their own property. So you need to know what people want. And innovation is the only way you can be saying, oh, we're already doing this. How can we make it better? What can we do to, to refine it? Culture is key to organizational innovation. If you want to innovate, you have to have a very strong culture that enables innovation. Encourage risk taking, enable employees discretion. Don't avoid punitive performance reviews. People don't just that when performance management is coming, people that will be pity. Why? The way performance management should be done is a chart. In fact, performance management should not even meet the person by surprise. Because I give you feedback on the goal. If you are not doing that, well, I tell you, these are the areas that I feel that you can do better. This is lacking. This is. So even you, by the time performance management come, if you get an A star, you or yourself, you will already have seen the pattern. Again, data. Because feedback would have been given. Oh, maybe you are meant to do A, B, C tax. If you are doing only A very well, B is. B is falling through this, the cracks. C is lagging behind. Performance creates psychological safety. One of my former bosses that I, 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 I wrote about her um, a few weeks ago, she put this psychological safety in it. And you must give it to, to that my boss. Jockey creates an environment as a boss where anybody can say anything. You are free to, you're always looking forward to go to work. Maybe not necessarily because of the work environment, but you have a fantastic boss that we can all sit down and talk about things. When there are deadlines, you all sit down and make sure you face the deadline. Even if you are going to be there till whenever, you will finish the deadline. She would have had that engagement with you. Define rewards and recognition. What will be rewards and recognition? Focus on diversity and inclusion. Companies that have a higher than average diversity rating have 19% increased innovation. Promote collaboration possible within a virtual environment or the physical environment. Whether people are working or they are they are with they are doing machine learning or whatever they are doing, um, we have companies now where okay, so I attended a tech event, a global sometime last year, and while we were there, um a robot was a robot was serving, a robot was serving. And there were still waiters that were serving too as well. And the robot was also serving. The emergence of new HR roles. Okay, so in conclusion, so I mean, it's not collaborative. People are working with robots. You must have it at the back of your mind. We work with, with robots and things like that. Um, promote collaboration. I've finished. So in conclusion, this is my last slide. We can't even achieve anything without data. You know, years ago, um, we used to have this TED talk, book reviews in one of the organizations I work with. And one of these TED talks, so when we're having staff general meeting, we watch TED talks and people would talk through and everything was quite engaging. And I remember at the time we watched a TED talk and they said, oh, with the future of the of the workplace, a lot of jobs will be taken away. Hey, people were like, Trump. 
They said a lot of jobs will have to go. In Dubai, they don't have driver that drives their train. And I did not know that they did not have a driver for a very long time. The day I got to know, I said, it's like I'm not in the street again. As it, it felt funny to me now. How can a train be going around the city from one place to the other? And nobody is driving it. It's just somebody is just sitting down in a control room. They don't jam themselves. So one, as one is moving and it's, it's fast, one is moving the metro, another one is moving after it. And I said to myself, what I thought um, with this, there will be no jobs for people. Every day they are looking for, they are looking for people to recruit. In fact, last week they just brought out another law to say it's invite be able to open. It's a country that is eighty nine percent of the people who who stay there are exported. So you can imagine how many people, excuse me, who live there and um, work there. They just came for work walk come and walk there and yet they are technologically advanced i told you that in a in a conference you will see robots going around with food on it serving people and then you still see waiters too going their own way they blended both the the physical with technology so eventually there'll be um, as some HR roles, traditional HR roles, uh, personnel manager, there are some roles that will go because they will no longer be relevant. And we can as those roles are going, new roles are being created. And it applies to every profession. I have a doctor who does um, um, occupational health doctor. If in years ago, before we were talking about mental health and everything, I'm not sure that that, that doctor will have a job. He will not have a job. He told me he deals with veterans who have gone to war, who have gone to this and that. People he deals with who are having mental issues, they have post-traumatic stress disorder, they have all this sort of disorder because they've been in, in, in the battlefront, the thing is affecting them. And how many people are in that role? We may just know, oh, uh, maybe surgeon or whatever, or whatever. For a very long time, I didn't know there was an ENT doctor until at some point my child had to, was ill, and then we had to take him to a specialist. They call them ear, ear nose, and throats. That's their job, anything that has to do with. So look at it this way. Anything that happens, it will create new opportunities. More opportunities are coming up with in HR. And it's the people who embrace this technology, data analytics to manage. Those are the people that will be able to take an advantage of it. You have the emergence of new HR roles, such as human machine teaming manager. We now have an HR role called virtual team manager or virtual dispatch team managers. I mean, different kind of roles. Or um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, like um, a combination of virtual and physical because you now have teams that are working physically, some are working remotely, and then you still have to manage all of them together. Pre-COVID, how popular was that? How many companies were recruiting people for that role? You have people data specialists. All they do is so just collecting data. Every data. Why are people living? Why are people living? This our big named organization for a smaller organization. Huh? Some people will say, I can't come and kill myself. Why? Why are people? Why are people even leaving jobs and saying, you know what? Right now, I don't even want to work. I want to be a consultant. 
all they do is collect those data and use it to make decisions. Maybe for roles, even before now, there were roles that we had when I was working in the financial services sector because of the complexity of that role. They will be open, they will be telling HR, you've not been able to, but well, HR cannot find because guess what? There are not too many people in that role. Actuaries, people that studied actuarial sciences and they are the ones that they, they deal with the numbers in insurance, very rare. You can be there or recruiting, making people offers. By the time you see one person like this, the person will tell you he's going to London. What of the trend of these days? I learned banks have lost 80% of their technology staff. That's why you transfer something. One man transferred money. They debited him three times. Only one time I arrived at the person's place. Tech disruption. Digital evangelists. Cyber security experts. As people are working more remotely, hackers are not playing. They too, they've increased their, their, their game. So more people need people that have skills in that regard. And so many, 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 and so on and so forth. Shows where the function of HR is moving. So you need to understand the trends. For companies to stay ahead of the game, HR, must take his rightful seat in driving innovation culture across the organization. Without that, is either the organization falls up along the way or dies. They're going to struggle. They're not going to be able to thrive. Thank you for listening. Wow, 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 wow. Balaji, that has been an interesting, engaging, explosive 90 minutes. Just to let you know that you've done 90 minutes. You see that it's very easy to do 90 minutes here. Yes, I'm, okay. I'm frankly, I thought I was going to do one hour, but I guess 90 minutes was more. Thank you. And it was worth it, well worth it. Earlier in the conversation, you mentioned something about chat GPT. And you said you probably touch on it. So I just wanted to remind you as to maybe Okay, so to thank you. Thank you for that. So for me, for chat GPT, people are saying um it's going to change the other of things. Oh, people are afraid. Oh, Google is going to go out of uh, Google might become extinct. In fact, immediately chat GPT GPT rather came out. Google came out with another version of that thing. But why did I say for me, I was not, I, I believe in my own creativity and innovation. Let me own my own work that I did it. I just feel it's, it's a lazy man's job. But my mentor and I had a conversation and, excuse me, and he said this to me. He said, guess what? It will come to a time. Maybe the things that you send people to school to go and be studying, they don't need it. Even teachers are afraid because a, a young chap can write an essay, not written by him or how, is written by the chat GPT app, and they will tweak it, tweak it, you will be looking like their own. So what's the point? Maybe it's not time for creativity. So since it has eliminated some things that, oh, instead of me writing a memo, or writing a letter, if something, there's something that will just key in the letter, I just need to put, oh, Bolaji and Yemi's meeting, meeting memo. It will just put everything together. What did you discuss and all of those things? Maybe we need to use, we need to look inwards and begin to do something more creative and innovative rather than what we had before. I hope that clarified. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bolaji. Um, someone here, Jennifer says, good evening, Bolaji. Thanks for your wonderful presentation. Please, what's the difference between HR metrics and HR analytics? Okay, thank you very much. So HR metrics are KPIs, key performance indicators that are used to measure HR. Those are HR metrics. Why HR analytics? The data that you got 
over a period of time that shows different parameters. So like we talked about recruitment and selection, attrition and all of that. But metrics drills down to say the is like what you are being measured upon. So I will give you an instance. There are organizations that have HR metrics to say you must not have more than 5% attrition rate in a year. You must train an employee and average every employee in the organization. Those are HR metrics must um, be trained for an average of 40 hours and above in a year. So all the trainings that, that um, every employee in that organization must attend must be X, Y, Z amount. HR metrics could be, HR must not spend more than this amount on people recruitment or something. Those are HR metrics. But data analytics collection of metrics inferred over a period. It could be quarterly, it could be yearly, it could be half yearly that shows trend, that shows pattern, that shows analysis is going beyond that particular thing is wider now to say, let's check what data do we have to show where our people exit, where people are exiting to. That's now data, even though they're giving you a um, metrics to say your, your exit rate should not be more than 5%. But analytics should not be. Those 5%, where are they going? Why are they resigning? What's the purpose? That's now data. You want to know why, but the metrics is specific. You don't have to pass this one, this um, percentage of attrition or turnover rate. But meanwhile, the data, the data analytics that from all the exit interviews that you've done, where why are people resigning? What is the trend? of the major reason people are resigning. If people are resigning typically because of no, you are paying them um, less than industry, then I mean, at some point in one of the companies I worked for, we did salary, um, um, they call remuneration survey. That's why it was called. Remuneration is the same thing as salary. Um, so we did the remuneration survey at the time. And what was this remuneration survey meant to? to analyze with the data that we've collected we realize that when people get to a particular level in the organization they will exit for the competitor the data is what helps you gives you that information so the data showed us that where were they going to they were going to competitors so when they go to competitors what role are they going to get there maybe they give them two two levels up then that survey made us realize that some particular levels were not competitive in terms of money or benefits. So if I'm going to be moving to a next level where the, the increase of my salary is just about 10, 15%. Meanwhile, competitor will give me 40 to 50%. Excuse me, that's now data. Does it make sense for me to remain in the organization? Or would I jack out to go to where they'll give me more money? So for an organization that has seen that data is now to go back. And that was what the organization did to realign payments across the board, to realign compensation benefits across the board. What they first did is they did an all round increase to say 30% increase across the board. That way it boosted people to a particular level. And then they were able to isolate pockets of um, anomalies within the system. So that's the difference between HR metrics and HR data analytics. Thank you so much, Bolaji. A lot of commendations, a lot of people celebrating you, appreciating you. Do we have anyone who has a compelling question? We can take one, one or two, please. You can unmute your mic and ask. We can take one or two questions so that we can release Bolaji. All right. I think we are good. Hello, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thank good you evening. so much for your training. I enjoyed every bit of it. So my question is um 
for me, where can we get this type of training? Where would you recommend an in-depth HR analytics training, not just the theoretical part? Because over time, most times when someone says they're having a trainer, I don't want to call names, you go. They're just speaking theory. I just, um, I don't know if you can recommend somewhere where we can go to learn more so we'll be able to equip it or maybe a particular place we can read up on our own that will even get the first-hand knowledge or information about how to use our data to make decisions. Thank you. Um. So, I mean, there are um, consulting firms that do HR data analytics training, um, I do as well. And then you can go to places like LBS. LBS was one of the places that I learned a lot about, about data analytics. But the only thing is that you have some of their courses that are data and HR data analytics, you can find it. The Phillips Consulting, all those um, top um, learning organizations, they do um, such training. But LBS is a place that if you if you want to go for that training, I mean, they, I'm not even sure that there's any LBS um, person here, but that was where I learned and a real exposure. I attended a course. It wasn't just a data analytics course. It was an advanced human resource management course, but it had a robust aspect that spoke about data analytics. Um, so where anything Thank you need to do. So, I mean, you can get it from various um, organizations of reputation. I think Workforce Group 2 does. So many of them. All right. Like so I saw a question here. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said, okay. Okay, that's oh. the one she said, theoretical training. Yes. It was the same person. So I saw a question here. How do you advise someone who has been in an this role for over four years to focus on a particular specialty in the role and if and if yes which one based on experience and current trends you can see um the thing there will still be somebody that will be i'm very very sure mark my words that i said this year and you can quote me a time will come there will be a role called hr evangelist it might not have come somebody has giving me that name before because of my kind of experience. This was a very long time ago. And I said, I see you becoming an HR evangelist. And what's an HR evangelist? Somebody who goes and talks to people about how to embrace human resources. HR is having challenges with a lot of um, SMEs and M M small, medium, micro, small, medium, M, S, M, E or something. And why most of the business owners cannot connect with what HR has to offer, or they already have a, per a perception of what they feel HR should come and do. So they need somebody to educate them, to make them understand that this thing that you are telling HR to come and do, this is not necessarily, and uh, it's a skill that that person has to build to convince the person that it is not a traditional HR role anymore. HR needs to be involved in the business to understand the numbers, to know the, 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 the complexities, the dynamics of the industry, of the business, of the company, of so many things like that. You will find that over time, there would be that needed role where somebody have to or would require to start educating people. An evangelist is like preaching to tell people, you know, you need HR, but it's not what you think you need it for. That's what you are using it for. So you may need to give the HR person. What would that do? It changes the perspective of the business owners when HR is, is being or, or is being recruited into their organization. So they don't feel that, oh, this person is just meant to come and be pushing paper and say, okay, how many people uh, just recruit? Okay, just do this like monotonous. Not all these strategic things that we're talking about. I think that's it. So you, you can be anything you want to be typically in HR, but it depends on what you want. Yes, from four years, you can choose to. By the time I did four years in HR, 
I decided what I wanted because I started HR in HR consulting. And I told myself, I, when, when I've done four years, I did my CIPM exam qualified. I had four jobs opportunity. One, I even eliminated it because it was going to take me totally away from HR. The second one was going to take me into some aspects of HR. But I looked at that industry. I didn't even understand anything about the industry. And I said, industry that I don't understand. I don't think I want to work in somewhere I don't understand. And it's not like I hear about them like that. So I narrowed down to two. The second to the last, which was the first offer that came to me, it was going to take me into specializing in what I've done before. Because I started from training and development. I said, no, I want to be a generalist. So as it gets money, facts, benefits, I dropped that opportunity and went for the one that was going to make me do HR, to be a robust HR person. I was doing recruitment. I was doing everything in HR. I was even doing corporate services, which included admin as well. So it all depends what your career goals are. Nobody can make that decision for you. You have to make that decision by yourself. I hope that clarifies it. Thank you so much, Balaji. You have been extremely helpful. Well, based on insights we have gotten from analytics, it's time to go home. Thank you so much. We'll meet again soon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you to our facilitator, Paula G. Shote. We appreciate you. On behalf of the over 80, 90 people who joined at one point or the other, and the other people who watch the recording on the YouTube channel, would like to say thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you, and do something with the information you've had tonight. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Yemi, for having me. Bye.